Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session. Uh, we have here with us uh, Thomas Vless. He is the managing director of the Dutch Startup Association, and he's going to take us on a tour uh, to tell us how to start a business in the Netherlands. I will leave the stage for you, Thomas. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, it's, uh, it's always a pity that we cannot do this with, uh, in real life, but uh, yeah, let's hope we can do this uh, together next year. Um, yeah, today um, I, will, uh, I will start by giving a short introduction about myself. Um, let me see if my screen sharing is working. It is. That's good. Um, and, uh, and then we'll go, uh, yeah, talk about the ecosystem and some other things. I'll get back to that too. Uh, so yeah, I'm Thomas. I'm a Dutch entrepreneur. Uh, I used to be a strategy consultant and then I founded my first company in uh, cat products. Sounds really random. And the name, it was Poopy Cat. So it's even more random. Uh, and that was about the dream journey for any entrepreneur. So I started and after five years, we grew to uh, 18 countries and eventually we, uh, we sold it to the market leader. So uh, pretty cool journey. And after that, I was hooked of being an entrepreneur. So for me, it's, uh, it's super cool to, to talk to you as aspiring or, or already started entrepreneurs and to sort of inspire you more and make you more enthusiastic of, of doing business for yourself. Um, now I'm uh, the director of the Dutch Startup Association. I'll, I'll get back to that as well because it might be helpful for you later in the presentation. Um, for me, it's always good to stand still about what you can get out of this presentation. So um, there's three things that are important to know. So I want to tell you a bit more about how the startups in Holland are performing, how big the market is, some, some opportunities, some challenges, uh, and also introduce the Dutch Startup uh, um, Association to you. Um, then I'll get a bit more in, the, in how you can start your business here. And the last thing I want to give you today is, let's say, a short overview of some government support that is available here to, uh, to you as an entrepreneur. Um, the, oh, also good to mention is if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat and the moderator will, uh, will ask me the questions uh, either uh, at the segment if it's very relevant or after the presentation in the end. There will be a Q&A. Um, so yeah, the Dutch ecosystem. Um, we're actually, can, we're, I'm a Dutch guy, so I'm of course promoting the Dutch ecosystem, but I'm, I'm pretty proud of it, how we're doing it for such a small country. Uh, here you can see the ecosystem value. We're in the, in the top 20 of the, of the global funding. And uh, in the last research of Startup Genome, we were considered number three of the most valuable ecosystems in Europe. And uh, now after COVID, there's still the question, uh, are we still there? But like, uh, at, uh, uh, let's say we're still a very good place to be if you want to grow your, your business. Um, startups are super important for the Dutch economy. Um, as you can see here, uh, we're the main, uh, the main contributor to the crop, uh, job growth uh, of, it, of the entire country. So uh, that's, that's uh, something that's really cool to see. And even during COVID, there's still an increase in jobs. Um, so for like, not only for innovation, but also for jobs and for, for the, like, the economic value of the country, startups are imperative. Um, then, yeah, this is normally what I do uh, interactively, but since we're not together, uh, I'll, I'll do it a bit like this, but like uh, Holland has a relatively high amount of unicorns. Normally I would do around and ask, let people ask the, the questions. Uh, of course, it's a bit, uh, there's, def there's definitions of what a unicorn actually is, but again, for, for Holland, we now have actually 14 unicorns from our, from our country, which is good because it also increases your chances of, uh, of your startup here and uh, to do other things. Uh, here's a sh short overview uh, about where the Dutch startups are located, which, uh, which, uh, which areas. And as you can see, for example, well, software is, uh, is, of course, logical. Uh, but fintech, for example, Agen and Molly are both really big uh, unicorns, really, uh, really famous as well, so you probably know them. And uh, what we can see here is that, that, that the, there's, a, there's a lot of, there's a broad way of how startups can work. And there's also one thing that's good to mention is that, that when we're talking about startups, we shouldn't only talk about startups as tech startups, uh, because there's also quite some cool things going on with, for example, the vegetarian butcher uh, or swap feeds, where you can basically uh, have a full circle product as a service bike, uh, bike platform. So it's actually uh, more than just tech. So also when you're starting your business, uh, like uh, don't only look at uh, technical solutions. Um, so, in Holland, yeah, again, I'm here also to, of course, promote, uh, promote a bit of what we do. Um, so Holland, of course, in Europe has a pretty good location. We're, we're sort of in the middle. We have a good infrastructure. Uh, you can travel to Paris, to London, uh, to Berlin in a couple of hours. Um, we have, in principle, in Holland, everybody speaks English. Uh, even a lot of other languages are quite common. 
and we're doing really well in terms of innovation like a lot of things and this started off way way back with philips but still we're doing uh, we're doing quite well in that area uh, and the last thing is also like our polit political system is quite stable but it's also quite predictable so unlike for example the us uh, if you get a startup visa here you can get a startup visa here in five years and probably five years ago uh, you could also get it and that's something that's also good to know that you're not uh, like uncertain of where you will be um I, I think the the main reason why i wanted to share this with you as an opportunity is that now of course silicon valley is such a mega place for startups um but it's a bit of an outdated model as well like like we we believe that there's not going to be one next silicon valley but there's going to be a lot of smaller super hubs around and we definitely think that amsterdam will be one of them we're now number 12 um but we're still growing and there's a lot of lot of things we can do here um also good in this terms is when you look at the history a bit you can see like these are the are the that the, the sectors that have the highest annual growth um of course the the food tech you can relate to uh, companies like picnic or the the new challenger crisp uh, e-commerce you can think about companies like kubu and, and bull but also on energy we do quite a lot of new things again this is also to show you a bit like what what kind of uh, areas you might be working in and if it's a good idea to start doing that uh, in holland if you look at the global scale of course you can see some some bigger trends and then uh, in this slide i wanted to show you that like uh if you if you double it down and um, become more specific you see that in europe food and fintech are still quite quite big and then all of the newest trends already are going to agrotech uh, life science and food tech and uh, food tech you can for example think about just eat or takeaway or uh, uh, Deliveroo, the kind of companies are, are doing uh, doing quite well. Um, it's not the only things that are that are moving, but it's good to know that where we now excel in. Um, yeah, so of course we're now in a in a worldwide crisis. I'm sitting here in front of a camera uh, at home, even uh, rather than standing on a stage and, and having an actual interaction with you guys. Um, and this is an important slide because it sort of slow shows you that I don't know if you already have an idea or if you're working on on any. But if you are in these industries, then the, like there's uh, there's some some benefits to it. So of course, accelerating industries we can understand. They're a bit in line with what I said before. But also in COVID, of course, e-commerce and fintech uh, are the companies that really grow as well. Food tech is following us on the third place because yeah, people are ordering more food from home. People are more ordering more groceries from home. So those industries have to benefit. Uh, mobility, of course, those kind of things are slowing down and down sizing industry so industries that hit the hardest uh, is travel events uh, and recruitment and events especially of course in holland we're quite big for events so it's uh, yeah it's a real pity for uh, for all the cool startups also in that area that we had um in, in holland yeah the biggest cities to be in is amsterdam the capital of course uh, rotterdam is the second and utrecht is the third it's quite uh, like like all these cities have their own identity so it's quite cool and uh, why I want to show you a bit more is because in Holland, everybody can name the top three. But after that, there's also specific areas, which is interesting. Uh, the Hague, for example, is very good in, uh, in things related to uh, regulations, but also security, cybersecurity. Uh, particular startups like that go to The Hague. Eindhoven is more on the technical side. So you can think of ASML, like it's semiconductors. And Delft is, is more also the, the, the tech part. So depending on your startup, uh, you can either choose to choose to to settle down in one of these cities or just go for one of the one of the major cities that are there. Um, unfortunately, Holland is a very small country, and I want to want to just show you with uh, with the next chapter uh, a little bit on what I what I see that uh, yeah, what kind of uh, challenges we face on both a global and a national level. Um, yeah, so on the global level, of course, uh, due to the COVID crisis, we see a decrease in VC investments. Of course, this is uh, yeah uh, it's something that's out of our control. Uh, it also means that for startups, it's more difficult to create revenue. Um, in Europe, uh, there's there's some other things that are playing along, and I think uh, the best way to uh, to explain it. Sorry, I'm skipping my own slide here, but it's better. Is that if you look at Europe, um, Europe is a very fragmented market. So as a total, we're we're still quite significant, but every country has an own language and own culture. Uh, and it's not as easy to make one product that fits all. Um, so even if you take the, the, the language out of the equation, the way you do marketing might be a hit in Holland, but completely different in France or in, or in Germany. 
And that's something you need to realize. And uh, there's a famous saying that says like, if you can run your business in, in the Netherlands, it will work anywhere. And I'm a firm believer that that's true, but still you need to consider that there's all different cultures and that means it's also more expensive to expand. If you're in San Francisco and your product works in San Francisco, you can roll it out to any big city in the US and in Europe, that's more difficult. And um, the other thing that's, that's, that's good to know is that because of the, the, the lack that we have, there is, uh, yeah, there, there, there are difficulties with, with the number of super hubs, as we call it. They're a little bit smaller. It's a little bit difficult to get uh, growth capital. Um, so again, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenging environment sometimes if you want to accelerate your international growth. On a national level, uh, this is actually, uh, yeah, um, this is maybe something that's a little bit more, more typical Dutch. It was also researched. Um, but the Dutch people are quite risk aversive. And this unfortunately also has an impact on the way we do our investments. So my personal experience as well is that for, let's say pre-seed and seed rounds, uh, it's, it's quite difficult in the Netherlands to find the, the, the right parties for this, the right VCs. In Holland, usually from 50K monthly recurring revenue, so 50K revenue per month, uh, you're eligible for VC funding. Below that, if you have a strong growth, maybe sometimes, but otherwise, you're more focused on, let's say, the accelerators. Um, and that, that, I think, is a huge mistake because uh, even in a very early stage, you can do a lot more. Uh, and that's different in countries uh, like the USA again. Uh, and it's good for you guys to, uh, to understand. From, from a personal thing, my, la my last company, I got a seed round and I had two investors from New York and one from Amsterdam, but the company was based in Amsterdam. So that gives you a bit of an, uh, bit of an idea. Um, and the, the, yeah, the problem with this is that the VC rounds are not only more difficult to get, but also they're a little bit smaller than, uh, than, than the countries surrounding us. And it's not necessarily a huge problem because it's also maybe a more healthy way to grow. Um, but the matter of the fact is, is that that also creates that you're growing slower. And that's, uh, that is a pity if you're competing with a product that's also, for example, at the same time uh, coming from the UK, because you might lose it on, uh, on that sense. Um, so those are a bit on, the, on the, the cons of, let's say, starting your business in Europe. All of, of, uh, all, all of them can be beaten, but it's good to know for you guys that, like, hey, uh, when I'm going to do this, uh, I need to like, keep in mind that my starting market is there and uh, well, everything I mentioned. Um, I also wanted to uh, drum down a little bit about the investment climate. Um, the investment climate is pretty good in, uh, here for us. Um, this this shows you a bit uh, that uh, like uh, how we uh, how we did. We're number seven in Europe uh, in terms of uh, so, sorry. The, um, we're number four actually behind uh, Switzerland and France uh, and the United Kingdom now, and that's pretty good. And it's mainly related uh, to, uh, to to the big exits we had uh, had this year. Um, and we're the seventh European. This is what I actually wanted to say in the last slide. We're the seventh European country with the highest investment. Um, and here you can see something that is really cool for you guys to know. So there's a lot of investors, there's a lot of accelerators and incubators. And I think for most starting companies, that's the most interesting area to be in. Um, if you look at it, uh, the last four years, the market grew significantly in terms of investment. So we're becoming more mature and there's more money becoming available. And even 2020 shows that there's still a high, uh, a high volume of, of deals being made. I mean, the, the people, expect that we're going to reach the same state as 2019, which is pretty good if you consider Corona. Unfortunately, when you look at deal volume, you see that it's a lot lower. And yeah, one of the reasons for that is uh, there's been a, quite a few big rounds, for example, with Molly, who became a unicorn, Messagebird, who became a unicorn. And those huge numbers have a huge impact, of course, on the totals. Uh, but for the smaller startups, we still see that there's a decline due to COVID. Logical, you can say, but also good, uh, good to know. Um, yeah, here is also something that's interesting. Um, the reason why I think it's good to share with you is to show you where the, the most investments are being done. And it also gives you uh, like, a, like a good idea of how good your startup will score here. Uh, a great example is, um, is a few guys I met at some point in London. They were old VC guys and they wanted to start a business. And most entrepreneurs will look at the market and will see like, okay, where in the market can I, can I solve the problem? Where can I do this? And they did nothing about that. They only looked at which markets is the most money in? So where can you get easy investment? Where's the highest exits? And they came up with the ideas 10 years ago to start a retail coffee business, or let's say a coffee brand with coffee shops. Uh, and as an entrepreneur, of course, you would laugh about it, but they made it super successful. 
only by looking at these factors. So again, if you have no idea yet, it's always good for any country to see, okay, what areas are hot, what, what do VCs like? Are there any specific VC players that only invest in certain uh, areas? This is the way to look at it as well, to see how eligible is, is your business. Um, this is a map, they're publicly available. Uh, I'm not sure if it's possible, but I'm, I can also make this presentation of you available to you after the session. Uh, this is basically all the big players that are uh, in the VC world in the Netherlands, uh, sorted by stage. If you're looking to, to talk to investors and you already have a running business and you want to change your business to the Netherlands or expand here, uh, this map is a very good place to start. Um, again, it's, uh, it's available as well if you want to look at it in more detail. Uh, for you guys also, I added a slide on the major accelerators. Um, there's quite a lot and some of them are really cool and I'll get back to you later why it's important sometimes to join them because it's also related to the start of Visa. Um, but again, a lot of opportunities here. Some of them are related to universities, other are doing particular, let's say, uh, innovations or focused on health. Um, but again, for most things, there, there's programs available and usually programs are relatively founder friendly. Um, yeah, the Dutch Startup Association, so my, my current role. Um, I, uh, I wanted to start showing you this slide. It's a bit, uh, it's not a very technical slide, but it's basically the journey you make before you become a scale up. Uh, and it doesn't really matter where you are in these things because we're here for, for all these people that are in any of these phases. And after you, let's say, reach a certain phase where you're growing so big, in Holland, for example, TechLeap is also there. Uh, Prince Constantine uh, is somebody we also have regular meetings with. He's also speaking at this conference. Uh, they are more focused on helping the, the scale up to grow and we're there for the, for the entire ecosystem and mainly also for the very young companies and the very young entrepreneurs. Um, we were founded in 2017. Um, so what happened was is that, uh, let's say the top 10 tech companies in Holland at the time. So you can think about Google and Booking, uh, the next web, those kind of companies, they were all lobbying with the government. And uh, yeah, they sort of saw that like, uh, yeah, despite, uh, despite their efforts, they all were lobbying for the same thing, but they're all were doing it actually the same things, but next to each other. So they sort of created the WhatsApp group and saying like, let's do it together. Uh, and then the realization came that like their, their, let's say, intentions were good, but also for most startups, the, 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 the things they lobby for are actually the same for a lot of startups. So they said, okay, let's, let's make an association, let's open up. Uh, and now the group of founding members, as you can see here, joined in the early stage. But later on, also a lot of other uh, startups joined. And we're now having over 400 members and we're the largest independent uh, advocacy group for startups in the Netherlands. Um, our mission is to make the Netherlands a startup-proof nation. Um, we're doing quite well already, but we're not entirely there yet. Um, and what we're doing is, I will show you in a bit, and start a proof nation, what it means is, like, we want to make sure that, um, let's say, if you're an entrepreneur in Holland, that you don't have any problems that make it difficult for you to, to run your business. Uh, we want to make sure that your voice is heard, and we want to make sure that people understand you. Um, the three things that we're doing are, uh, the first of all, lobbying, which I mentioned already. So, uh, we're, for example, the startup visa we're involved in. This is very relevant for you guys. So, this is also the reason why I'll, I'll get into it a little bit later as well. Uh, fiscal support, you can think about, like, let's say, uh, creating attractive arrangements for, uh, for people to, uh, to invest in companies. Uh, but it's also about financing, uh, impact laws, anything you need for, uh, for startups. We're the ones that talk to the government and making sure they, they understand. Um, then the community. So uh, when you have 400 members, uh, it's a very valuable ecosystem and uh, we want to make sure that they connect to each other. So from the, from the let's say, the, the thought that, uh, that like we're, we, we want, uh, we're not the people who want to tell the entrepreneurs how to like run their business, but we think that it's very good if there's a, a knowledge transfer between the startups. Um, so we actually facilitate that they are connected to each other and that if one of them has a question, they can talk to each other and not only on the founder level, but also, let's say, on the level of, uh, of, of marketing uh, director and the head of growth from companies. Uh, we found that you don't have to make each other's mistakes and it sort of uh, helps you grow your, uh, your business. Um, normally, we do that a bit more of, with offline events, but now, of course, a lot of them is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is online. Uh, the third one is research, um, and this is basically we, we sort of uh, yeah, execute research to give our media and our political stakeholders the right information to, uh, to make the decisions. Uh, and also, like, let's say, inform the public on what startup is and why they are important. 
Now, here's a quick overview of some members that we want to have. Um, if you want to become a member, so if your business is in the Netherlands uh, or is uh, active in the Netherlands, it doesn't matter, you can become a member. It's only 15 euros per year. Uh, we have this weird rule in Holland where you have to pay a small amount, otherwise your vote doesn't count. So it's more of a, of a symbolological uh, message, uh, but you can join via the website. Um, as mentioned, I wanted to go into the startup visa. I think this is one of the, one of the main roads uh, to starting your business here in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, so the, the start of visa. So the, the first thing is it's, uh, it's a one year resident permit for non EU people. So if you're from outside the European Union, you can get this for a year to launch your startup here in the Netherlands. Um, you need to have a facilitator for it. I'll get back to that as well. Um, and it really is to, to help you uh, like sort of prove, uh, prove your business and go to, a, to product market fit. Um, there are some things you need to do for it. Um, and um, let me see what's good. Yeah, so uh, the, what I wanted to show you is that the cost is quite low. Um, and um, it's, this is actually what I wanted to show you. So a facilitator is somebody who helps you out and shows you the ropes. Um, this is actually quite important because this is, this is also the person that's gonna help you throughout the duration and, and entire process. There's a lot of different, uh, different desks you can, uh, you can contact with this. Uh, if you have any questions about this as well, we can also help you and, uh, and provide you with, uh, with the right people. Um, and basically they help you out with, with, with the tax, with opening a business account, opening a bank account, but also with the visa stuff. Uh, and it's pretty cool. Um, the, the recognized facilitators here in the Netherlands are, uh, are for example, the list that we have here. Um, then this is, these are official, official uh, like collaborations. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this is uh, good to know. So it cannot be a family member and it needs to have some kind of business relation. Um, again, more details of this I will share with you later as well if you want. Uh, just hook me up a message and we can we can do. Um, but again, this is it should be a business relation and not a family family relation. Well, after you apply for your for your startup visa, you still need to do uh, do some things. Uh, and basically, it's uh, it's it's like starting your business. You need to register your company. Uh, and this is also why later on I will share a bit more about what kind of company structures you have in the Netherlands and what is good for you to start. Um, after the first year, you can extend it. Um, again, your facilitator will need to be, uh, be part of this. The costs are again, relatively payable, uh, and then you can go again. And this is in, in principle, again, to, to prove your business. And once your business is there, you can, uh, you can stay here and your business will be your, your main reason for your, uh, for your, uh, visa. The type of businesses that you can run. Yeah. It's a very, uh, one way, one way show, but soon we'll be there to, uh, to answer the questions that you might have. Um, the, the, the easiest one is ZZP. Uh, it's very quick and very easy to set up. It only costs 50 euros. It's sort of a personal company uh, and it's sort of intertwined with your personal taxes. So if I as a person was ZZP, my, I do one income tax and that includes also the ZZP. Um, this is what most people do uh, in the early stage, uh, but you are liable as a person for everything that happens. Um, another good option is uh, VOF. Uh, and a VOF is basically a sort of a partnership. Uh, so if you're with more than one, minimum two, of course, you can also do this. It's also relatively simple. It's also not super cheap. You do need to establish an entry with the notary. So there's some cost involved there, but they're usually a couple hundred euros. Um, and uh, this is great for partnerships if you just want to make sure that you can share everything with your business partner. A ZZP can never be, can only be one entrepreneur and a VOF can be two or more entrepreneurs. A private company is uh, the, the company where you actually want to move towards to. Um, it's a limited liability company. So that means that if, let's say, you do something with, uh, well, let's think of not a too morbid example, uh, but let's say you do something with gardening and you mess up a garden of somebody, uh, if from a ZZP or from a VOF, you're personally liable for the damages that's been made. Uh, with a BV, the company is liable, so you're a lot more safe from a legal perspective. Uh, the downside is that it's a bit more expensive to start. You also have to go to the notary um, and it's a separate tax entity, which means you have to do your VAT, um, but you have to do it with anybody, but you have a separate uh, like uh, annual report that you need to be done. And usually that costs, let's say, well, like if you do it very cheaply and do a lot of things yourself, maybe 500 euros, but usually it's around 1,000 or 1,500 euros minimum. Um, but the good news is that you can set up a holding structure, which is a very good way of saving on tax costs when you maybe exit your company at some point. Um, 
there's more information to get on this. Again, uh, we can share the presentation with you after, um, but the, the, this website will have a little bit more information about starting your company, but also about, uh, uh, let's say, the start a visa and how to get there. So the last bit for this presentation, I want to show you a bit about the government support that is out there. Uh, again, these are things that are open to anybody. So it doesn't, mean, doesn't matter if you're not from the EU or not from uh, uh, the Netherlands. Um, because anybody can, anybody who has an entity here can go in for one of these. Um, so the first one is the, uh, is sort of like for if you have a low income, you can get some support. The second one is a bit more of the loans that are, let's say, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're exporting a lot, it's, uh, it's for businesses that, that really invest in other countries. So let's say you, you have a business for a developing economy, the Dutch growth fund could be very interesting for you. Um, Again, we'll send this to you as well afterwards. Um, the Vroege Fase Financiering, again, I don't make up the names. Uh, it's like, let's say, early stage uh, financing. Uh, that's a really interesting subsidy scheme. It works a lot for, let's say, innovative products. Uh, and for academics, there's even a different, different thing. So let's say you have a technological solution and there needs to be a lot of money involved in them uh, to, to get to a certain uh, prototype. Those kind of things can be important. The WBSO is also very important because almost any company uh, with anybody on the payroll uh, can, can make benefit of this. And it means you get the, the, your research uh, investments you get back. And research in this sense is a very broad term uh, because for example, the Poopycat company I told you about uh, apparently had the, the innovative power to get this, uh, to get this, uh, this research uh, uh, scheme. And that again, this will save you a lot of money. So basically all the wage taxes that you pay, you can get back uh, on those things you spend on R&D. And a lot of companies spend some time on R&D. In the later stage, I'll go through this a bit quicker uh, because then we can still go to the Q&A. Um, these are more of the credit lines. Also very interesting to look at. They're a bit more for later stage companies. So it's good to know that they are there, uh, but these are not for, for early stage companies. So let's say in for the first, first few years, you won't really be eligible for this. Uh, but maybe after after five or eight years, these things come become more uh, more important. Um, yeah, the same is actually with these. So these, uh, uh, yeah, again, I wanted to put them in here. So when you uh, read the presentation later, you can uh, you can get back to it. The only one I want to stop at now is the ontwikkelingsmaatschappij. Um, the ontwikkelingsmaatschappij can also be interesting because that is basically a sort of public venture capital. Uh, and it's linked to the provinces. And a lot of people don't know this, but the provinces have quite a lot of money here in the Netherlands. So that is actually quite interesting to look at. And they also do more early stage uh, financing. So basically you can consider them uh, a VC, which is good to look at. Um, so I speeded through this because I thought I had more time, but now we have uh, some extra time for Q&A. So without further ado, um, maybe the moderator can come back and, uh, and see if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Thomas. This was really insightful. We have very positive feedback in the chat. You can't see it, but uh, everybody's happy with your presentation. Good news. I, I have no, no idea. So I'm just talking and maybe there's nobody. <laughs> no, no, people are there and they are really happy with it. Uh, so Perfect. somebody's asking about the uh, ZZP. If yeah. that's a personal tax number, which usually a freelancer has, or what's this number? Yeah, that's basically it. Let me just get back to the to that slide. Um, and again, I'm not sure how we can do it, but I'm happy to share these slides afterwards as well because there's a lot of information on it. So uh, now ZZP is indeed it's it's more for freelancers. Um, and um, yeah, so you get your own tax number, uh, so you can send out invoices. Um, but the the best part is that you can basically uh, like like you, you can act like a company and you are a company. Um, but you have only have to do one, uh, one tax uh, income tax statement rather than that you have to do one for your company as well. Right. And uh, another question is uh, for a startup that's still in the idea phase, would you recommend establishing it in the Netherlands or in the UAE? Um, well, maybe the, it depends a bit on the, on the startup uh, and what your, what your ambitions are, um, because there's no uh, there's no single answer that, that makes it happen. Let's say that if you have a product and you want to launch the product in the Dutch market, uh, I would do that. Um, if you want to do it the other way around, it's probably more logical to do it over there. Um, so uh, if, if, again, uh, it depends on where you want to be located as a team and it depends on where your markets are. I think those are the most important factors. Outside of that, you can also consider tax, um, but it's also a bit maybe related to the business you're in. So if you say, I'm going to be active in both markets, 
uh, you can look on where it's more uh, beneficial to you or where it's easier to get funding. Yeah, makes sense. And then we have uh, for a tech startup, if it's in an early stage in the Netherlands, where can they look for a pre-seed and seed funding? Yeah. Yes. So as I mentioned, and I'm I'm like I'm I really like Amsterdam. I really like the ecosystem here. So don't get me wrong. Um, but but yeah, the pre-seed and seed capital in the Netherlands is is just more rare. Um, it's it, it's out there, but it's more from let's say the the friends, fools, and the family. So more in the angel angel area. Uh, and also there is there are some ways to get it. But if you have a limited network, um, the easiest way is to look at accelerators. Accelerators are basically uh, seed funding. Uh, with programs as well, um, so the this, this slide with all of them uh, is good to uh, good to look at. And there's over a hundred here in the Netherlands. Uh, and the other thing is is to, uh, to to look at your particular market. I mean, if you don't try, you don't go. But the VCs that were in the overview, for example, the the more the more the bigger ones, they they traditionally do not invest in uh, in startups that do not have revenue yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you at what stage uh, can the um... At what stage should the startups go for accelerators or incubators? Uh, yeah, it, just, it, it also depends on the accelerator. In principle, you can go there in any phase. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard stories that there are companies that had already revenue and already were three years uh, in production, still went to join, uh, to join, let's say, accelerator programs. It can happen. Usually you do that. Well, we have the slide here, let's say more in the, in the validation uh, stage. And um, that's where I think accelerators have the most, the most benefit and the most power. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 technically it could be for anything. And, and let's say Antler, um, which is uh, quite a well-known accelerator from Singapore originally. They're now, I don't know in many countries, but quite a lot. They're also in Amsterdam. Uh, they, for example, are in a very early stage. You can come there without an idea even and then create your, create your, uh, yeah, your business over there. Um, but usually around the validation stage. Yeah, interesting. Uh, we have one last question. You mentioned that because of COVID, investments are like going down. Uh, for uh, someone who has a new idea and they just want to start now, should they wait or just go ahead and start? Yeah, it's a super, it's a super good question. Um, like, uh, there's a famous saying that says, "Never waste a good crisis." Uh, and I think uh, the the COVID crisis is none other. I mean, 2008 we had the financial crisis, and companies like Airbnb uh, came from that. Um, so now is definitely the time to, what I think, to start a business. Um, and the fact that funding is now a bit more limited is also because, of course, the the, the companies that now need funding are companies that are were active in the market that was pre-COVID and now are in a market that is that is in the COVID situation. Uh, and that means that, like, uh, if you're not a must-have product, uh, you might not be in trouble. If you're a travel startup, you, you're, you're in trouble. Um, but the good news is, is that now if you build a startup and you've been able to build it in this crisis uh, and it's resilient for, let's say, COVID, uh, I think it's easier to get money. Um, but again, your product needs to be a bit more of a must-have uh, and should not be an industry that's super high hit. So again, if you want to create a new airline, now is not the time. Um, but let's say if you have a product for home delivery of food, then now is the time. And eventually, again, if you can create some sort of business model and validate it, then it's easier to get money now than it was before. Yeah. So it depends on the idea. Yeah. And the industry. Yeah. But, but I mean, uh, it's, 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 I think it's definitely a good time to start. But uh, yeah, you need, to, you need to be aware. Like your market needs to be there. It's a crisis. And yeah. uh, some, some people are more affected than others. Yes. Uh, we have some more questions, but unfortunately, we have to end the session. Uh, uh, but yeah, but maybe if you share the presentation, then we can share it with the people in the and, um, audience. I mentioned somewhere uh, for the people who have, it's going to take one minute to go to the slide. Uh, oh, there, in the end, it was. So if you want to connect, you can add me to LinkedIn and you can ask me questions there. Um, and again, I think the organization will send the slides to you. So. It's a pity we can't have, uh, have more time to, uh, to go on the q and I hope it was helpful. Yes, it was very helpful. Thank you for joining us, Thomas, and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.